Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Beverly Kirk, director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative here at CSIS. We are very pleased today to welcome Her Excellency Erica Munez, the Foreign Affairs Minister of Panama for a wide ranging conversation covering several issues, including gender equality in Panama and the country's sustainability efforts in the region, among other issues. Partnering with us today on this event is the CSIS Americas program, and I am very pleased to welcome for remarks Dan Rundy, Senior Vice President and Head of the Americas program. Dan? Bev, thanks so much for that kind introduction, and thanks for inviting me to this important discussion. As Bev mentioned, my name is Dan Rundy, and I hold the Schreier Chair at CSIS, and I also lead the Americas program here. Minister Moines, I'm so honored that you're here with us. Thank you so much for making time. Panama is a great country and has a great future. And it's really important that the United States and Panama continue to have a great partnership together. Uh, I'm so looking forward to this conversation today about the steps Panama has taken to achieve gender equality across society, as well as environmental pledges to help combat the threat of climate change. Women are among the most economically vulnerable demographics in Latin America, as they are more likely to work in informal sectors and shoulder many household responsibilities without compensation. Women have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic globally, and especially in Latin America, where COVID-19 exposed economic inequalities in a dire manner. In Panama, almost half of employed women work in sectors most impacted by the pandemic, compared to a third of employed men. Panama has been dedicated to ensuring a more equitable, fu equitable future, especially in considering its post COVID-19 reform measures. As part of Panama's efforts to address a more equitable future, Panama's National Institute for Vocational Tra Training uh, and Training for Human Development with the support of the International La Labor Organization has developed a roadmap to promote women's participation in non-traditional careers and courses such as science and technology fields in which women have been historically underrepresented. Panama strives not only to create opportunities for women's education and meaningful participation in the workforce, but also to achieve equal representation and leadership positions. One measure the government of Panama has enacted is the establishment of a quota for women to make up 30% of state boards of directors. In addition to being a leader in gender equality, Panama has taken impactful, impactful steps to increase its environmental sustainability. The Ministry of the Environment has pledged to lead global efforts on ocean conservation, designating five special marine coastal resource management zones and more than 46 marine protected areas. The Panama Canal Authority has enacted improvements to its environmental and conservation initiatives to reduce its carbon emissions. Panama has made various other environmental commitments, including reducing the total emissions of the country's energy sector by 2050, restoring national forests, and joining the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, which aims to protect at least 30% of the planet by 2030, among other environmental pledges. Many of these initiatives are even more significant when considering that many other coastal countries in the region, such as Honduras, Nicaragua, and Guatemala have been facing some of the worst effects of climate change. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you again, Smart Women, Smart Power for the invitation and to Minister Moines for joining us to speak about these important issues for the region and for the world. Bev, back to you. Thank you so much, Dan. Really appreciate your kind words. Well, the Smart Women, Smart Power Speaker Series is possible thanks to our great partner, City, in funding and sponsoring this initiative. And here with remarks is Candy Wolf, the head of Global Government Affairs for City. Candy. 
Great, thank you, Bev. And thank you all for joining us virtually this afternoon for another great event in the Smart Women, Smart Power series. City's been supporting this series for six years now, bringing women leaders in foreign policy and national security and the business community to discuss pressing issues and leadership qualities. Today, we are just thrilled to have with us a groundbreaking female leader from Panama, a country where City has been for more than 100 years, uh, supporting economic progress, starting with the funding of the construction of the Panama Canal in 1904. City Panama has funded many other public works throughout the years, such as highway, the highway network, hospitals, and the recent construction of the country's first uh, metro system. And I understand uh, that the minister may share city's passion for the finer points of structuring uh, infrastructure investments. We also share uh, the foreign minister's passion for equal pay for equal work and applaud the voice that she has given to women who have disproportionately suffered in Panama and around the world from the impacts of COVID-19. I'm sure all of you are looking forward to this discussion with our speaker today as I am. And so I'll pass it back to Bev to get us started. Thank you again for joining. Thank you so much, Candy. Really appreciate it. Uh, typically right now we would toss to Nina Easton, our moderator, but we're having a bit of a technical difficulty. So Dan and I are going to begin the conversation with uh, Minister Munez and uh, we will work on the, uh, we will work on, well, we have do we have Nina back with us? Nina, are you here? We have me back, but I'm not sure how long it's going to last. So well, why don't we I'm... do a threesome moderation with all three of us? <laughs> Hi, Minister Moynihan. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Oh, good. Well, I'll just kick it off and then I'll let you all uh, jump in because this is a very uh, iffy technical situation. Um, First, we wanted to congratulate you on your appointment. You have such an interesting career trajectory um, from your studies in Panama to master's degrees at law, in law from the NYU and Berkeley and, um, and your fascinating um, career with the museum fund and, and with a law firm. So could you just talk about your career trajectory a little bit and um, kind of what vision you were following that landed you at this extraordinary position? Sure, thank you. Great to be here. Um, yes, I have kind of, I, I like to think of it more of a 360 view because I've been in government, um, in the private sector, I've been in a law firm. So I, 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 I think that I'm blessed by having sort of this general view. Um, I started working here. Um, this is in fact my second time in government. Um, and from here, I went on to work in a law firm in, in New York. And from there, I went into investment funds also in New York. And I actually came back to Panama a day before Inauguration Day, um, literally with duffel bags, my husband and my two children in town. So um, and since then, it's been um, uh, very interesting. I think being in government during pandemic, it's certainly not easy. It's a challenge that all governments were sharing. Um, and uh, But it's a challenge that I think we have to embrace and, and try to tackle as best as we can. Well, great. And so how is um, how are things going with the pandemic in Panama? Can you talk about the conditions there? Yeah, so we went through a rough time last year um, and we had several lockdowns uh, that were almost the entire country. Um, but because we are very concerned with maintaining our pledge sort of in terms of commer commerce and trade, we kept airports, we kept the Panama Canal, we kept all ports open at all times. So you were still a were able to manage cargo from Panama or pass through the canal. And in fact, we help uh, cruise ships that were in danger or that needed support through the Panama Canal uh, in order to, to provide much needed aid. Uh, but after those, I think, rough months last year, um, we, I think, through massive testing uh, that we've embraced, and I think we're one of the countries that are doing most testing within the region um, and the vaccines that, as we all know, it's sort of the hope. And I think we're um, 
again, one of the top countries now leading in terms of vaccination. It's been crucial. And so far, we're good, but you know that it can change at any point in time. So we are very careful and we are trying to keep maintain sort of this very cautious view of, well, yes, it's going well. It could change at any point uh, while we reach this critical mass in terms of vaccines. And of course, the pandemic is um, hurting women around the world, setting us back. And administration is focused on some equity initiatives on gender. Could you talk about those a bit? Yes, um, I, I think that we all share sort of the view and understanding that the pandemic has been extremely rough on women, particularly on a number of fronts. And I can say it sort of from firsthand experience as we walk and, and we deal with the aid that we're trying to provide when we come to homes and we're trying to support them. Um, you can you can witness firsthand that women that were that endured lockdowns were less likely to go and ask for help in domestic violent cases. Uh, the children, particularly girls, when they had to choose which of the two uh, children of the house would use, for instance, their phone or their tablet in order to be connected, it was always the boy that is chosen and not the girl. The girl will do sort of like the household chores. Um, and even for women, when we were looking at the data of who was going back to work, higher ratio of men, while women, for instance, had to stay behind and help uh, with school, schools not open, always relied more on the women supporting. And I, I have two children, two small children, and I can still, I'm still suffering from the frustration of having children at home that may or may not connect and nobody uh, to be there for them. So how to change that or how do I think we have to move on from the pandemic as an excuse or as a frustration or as evidence of what has happened in the past to how we change it into an opportunity. Um, we were anyway at the rate that we were going, the, according to the World Economic Forum, we would only reach um, um, salary or parity in, 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 at the job, uh, at the labor force in a hundred years. So we were not in a good path anyway. Um, so we have to think of what's happened as a momentum or a crisis to generate a different approach and a really, really structural approach, different approach. Um, and this is the first time that most of the governments are leading the economic recovery. It's not the private sector on its own, you need the government. So if you're really committed to having women at the center of the agenda, this is the time. Um, so we've, I, I think, uh, sort of on a trans, uh, a more of um, in every single approach from finance, uh, microcredits, well, can you do it specifically for women? Can you do tax breaks specifically for women? Can you do education since you're going to have a different, you have to reinventing yourself or new uh, women trying to come up with new uh, ideas or how to become entrepreneurs. Can you have something specific for women? And that's what we've tried to do, uh, to create sort of a niche opportunities across the board in different sectors. So you, you are actually creating true momentum for women. And this is Beverly, Madam Minister. You're, one of those areas of education you're working on is trying to get women to get more tech degrees. Can you talk about that? Yes, so Panama has sort of a great infrastructure. We have seven of the uh, fiber optic cables that go through Panama. Um, the airport, I mean, everything logistic-wise is sort of set for Panama to, to develop. And uh, the when we went through the pandemic, what was really truly uh, blossoming was everything on the digital front. And uh, if you, it is a way for to teach women or to train women that you can actually, instead of sort of going back into a labor force that you're not going to have the opportunities right now. So, you know, six or seven months, they're, they're just not going to be there. So if you can create these programs that um, use the time to educate in fields that will be actually the ideal fields of the future. And one of those, uh, clearly, everything from programming, blockchain, I mean, we have a number of them that are dealing with 
uh, developing the new startups, particularly women startups uh, for for the short term and midterm. It's really smart to prepare people for the jobs that are coming rather than the jobs that uh, that may not reemerge after the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to follow up. You mentioned that you even have uh, some difficulty uh, balancing everything. Is How is the government working to help women who may be undergoing the retraining and focusing on the jobs that will be the future and in helping them balance what they're doing to, to improve their job opportunities, but also to help them at home if they have young kids who also they're trying to help keep up with their own educational opportunities. Yes, yeah, so you know that one of the things that you have to do is not just to say like you have rights or you should you should be able to work. Well, that's great in theory, but is it actually uh, happening? And we saw when we, when we all started going back to work after sort of the and there was this employment suspension uh, of the labor contracts across the board. And when we were seeing people starting to go back to work, um, men, then women, and at the bottom were all the women that were on maternity leave. Those were not being reactivated by companies and by government. So we enacted a law in February forcing them to say, hey, because they were on maternity leave, that doesn't allow you the right to sort of discriminate and not allow them to have the opportunity to go back. So that's sort of a measure sort of top down forcing, I think, a little bit of the approach of uh, you can't sort of discriminate, particularly on women. Um, second is um, we have from the government perspective, uh, they're called CAIPIs, and what they are is for early childhood where you can leave them at work once you return. And we prioritize those even uh, beyond or on top of schools because you couldn't have women back at work if they didn't have where to leave their four-year-old. So those uh, centers were one of the ones that were prioritized in order to get them back uh, working in order for the women to be able to be that at work. But I will say from a personal experience, so I work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs where um, the entire cabinet, they're all women. And uh, it's, it's actually almost embarrassing how many women we have here. And I say that I, we have to be realistic and coherent with what we say. And if anybody here needs to stay at home and work, they'll still be able to provide the work. And sometimes you have to be flexible when you have children and you don't have where to leave them. They all produce the same, same amount of work, but we just have to be flexible and understanding in order to be coherent with what we want others to do. Mm -hmm. And something else that you're working on related to this is closing the pay gap, the gender pay gap. Um, can you talk about how Panama is one of the first countries to partner with the Equal Pay International Coalition? Yeah, we were one of the first countries in the region, and we're one of the seven members in the world that are part of the steering committee. And the pay gap is, is something that we need to, uh, we all sort of, I think, on a multilateral approach with accountability, because we all come up with figures and what is happening here, but there's no real accountability. And what we're trying to work is to actually create some mechanism where you are actually accountable for what you're saying that you're going to do. Be responsible and make sure that you're actually, uh, whatever laws that you're saying that you're passing are actually being effective in closing this mm -hmm. pay gap. Mm -hmm. And you, you talk about representation. You've written extensively on this topic, I should tell our audience. Um, and uh, you've talked about uh, creating the opportunities for education and meaningful participation in the in the workforce. But uh, it, pushing back, it, you've also advocated for the government establishing a quota for women to make up 30% of state boards of directors. Is that, it, how is that working? And how did you, how did you insta uh, install that? Yeah, so I am not responsible for the actual law, but I am helping to make sure that it's actually implemented. Um, because again, it's the accountability or so what happens if uh, is as a corporation or as a government, because we have both, um, you don't have in your board the 30%, nothing. So if nothing happens, then nobody's, nobody will actually change. And uh, so recently in one of the cabinet meetings, I went with that entire list of those who were not uh, meeting the standard, 
by name saying, well, you're not meeting, you're not meeting, because I think I have a responsibility. Uh, anyone with a leadership role, you have a voice and you have to use it um, in, in a meaningful way. And that also is, again, in this uh, context of accountability for, for those initiatives. It's, it's great to have laws. We all can have a, you know, a number of laws, but if they're not actually implemented, that you're not uh, creating true change. Mm -hmm. It, one last question in this in this area. How long do you foresee uh, it taking for women in Panama to per, perhaps reach um, gender parity with men in the society? I, I, I can say, I, let's say that I'm very hopeful that, as I was saying, with the pandemic to create this uh, with the crisis, an opportunity, and I think we're we're gaining a, a, a significant momentum. Um, let's hope that it continues. But the work, if you don't have representation at the political level, you're not going to have it at the other levels because mm -hmm. that is the one in charge of laws, initiatives, everything. And um, this is, I am a Minister of Foreign Affairs, a woman, uh, so I'm one of five out of 35. Right. There are only five women uh, in this region that are uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. I think nine percent of uh, heads of state worldwide out of 193 countries. So it is still so much that we can do. It's not because the women are not prepared. It's not because they're not educated. It's not mm -hmm. because they're not driven. The opportunities are not there. And I think a little bit has to do at this moment with uh, social media and the backing, I mean, the, the backlash for women or how they're attacked, how they're because of how they look, what they wear, uh, are they taking care of their children, all those things. And we need to talk about it and sort of take the myth out and, and be okay, all of us. I mean, right now, I'm not sure if my children are connected and I cannot feel terrible for that. I can't be perfect at all. I mean, the more that we talk about it and we motivate more women to be part of the conversation and to and to go for elected positions, I think the more momentum and change that we're going to drive. All right. Thank you. Nina, back over to you. Thanks, Bev. And that's so, um, you're so articulate on that, Madam Minister. Thank you. Thank you for those words. Um, let's turn to some other issues. Foreign, this next issue is both foreign and domestic. And that's, of course, the Panama Canal, which is, you know, when you think of Americans and Panama, um, that's what they think of when they're not thinking of retiring in Panama. Um, your ambassador to the U.S. in the past has rightly called that 1977 treaty returning the canal uh, to Panama in 1999. It was called one of the biggest diplomatic successes in the last 50 years. And I think that's that's quite right. Um, it's also played a big role in the economic growth of Panama. You have one of the high, or the highest, I guess, per capita income in Latin America. And uh, you've averaged an economic growth around 6% in the last 15 years, probably pre-pandemic. Um, can you talk about the canal's contributions to your economy and what it means? Yeah, so I, I think, and I just spoke to uh, somebody else who was writing a book on the management of the canal as sort of the big surprise, because it wasn't only the diplomatic effort to get it back, but then there was the big question mark, can the Panamanians truly manage it well? Uh, with all that goes in our region, are there going to be um, efforts to sort of manage it in a different way? Is it not going to uh, remain sort of very corporate governance oriented rather than more of uh, the local uh, or the flavors of the country and how it's managed? And I think that we've done a wonderful job at managing sort of Panamanians, for Panamanians, by Panamanians. Um, I was directly involved in the financing of the expansion of the canal that happened a few years ago, and it was a landmark financing within the region. And again, the same questions. Can they manage it? Is it going to be, you know, filled with corruption or is it going to be allocated? And none of that happened. So I think it is really uh, remarkable and it's uh, for Panamanians. 
um, it, it is sort of a beacon of how it can be properly managed. We are actually trying to have those same standards throughout in more of our government institutions. And uh, now uh, the use of the water reserve. So we have now the, the latest challenge that we have for the Panama Canal is that with climate change, there is less and lesser water for it to operate properly. So there is again this sort of new challenge and how we're going to create a water system to or to properly maintain it for the next 20 years. And that's already being handled, I think, in a fairly responsible manner. Great. And um, and of course, the uh, the canal is is means that when, with China um, and investments and interests in Panama, that makes uh, a lot of decision makers in the United States and so on quite nervous. And I wanted to turn it over to Dan to talk about China and Panama and where things stand. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Minister. Uh, the two main ports, the Port of Cristobal and the Port of Balboa are managed uh, on behalf of the government of Panama by Hutchison Wampoa, which is a Hong Kong-based company. My understanding is in the port of Cristobal, the contract ends in January of 2022. Could you talk a little bit about what's going to happen to the management of the port of Cristobal in January of 2022? What will happen? Yes, yeah, so first we have several ports. Those are the ones that are managed by Hutchins One Paul, but we have others that are managed by other companies. And for that one, we'll have to renegotiate the terms of whether we want it to extend or we want another company that's not been decided so far, but it will be by the time that it's that it needs to be either renewed or a new company in place. Yeah, the, the U.S. is, I'm ho I think, hoping that it'll be put out for bid and that other bidders may be able to compete for it. I worry that there may be sort of an extension of the current contract. I suspect others in Washington are watching this with great interest and are hoping that your government will will consider opening this up for bids. Obviously, it's often beneficial if other companies have a chance to compete. You probably will get more value from it uh, as a government if that were to happen. Do you think that's likely to happen, that you'll open it up for bid? Yeah, I, I think that uh, I'm not part of the commission that is in charge, so I don't want to like speak what, but it's not uh, within my previous responsibility. But I do know that they're looking at all the terms and the potential offers that they might get. But I don't think that there's been a decision on whether it's being renewed or whether it's going to be up for a bid. So I think as soon as that's the time, they will be announced uh, and uh Whatever is best for the country in terms of the operator side, that's not the only place where we have a potential uh, port in Panama. I think there are also plans for new development of ports. Uh, because of the Panama Canal, it just makes sense that we have more and more established here. What's the timeline for the decision by your government or, or by the commission in terms of how they're going to win? Because it's January of 2022. That's not not too far off. No, I think six months before they should be working towards the announcement of how they're going to manage it. And uh, um, Madam Minister, how would you characterize your relations with China and China's um, investment uh, in Panama? How would you characterize where things stand now? Yeah, so um, the U.S. has always been our, our longest and strongest ally and will continue. And I think with this new administration, we're actually hoping to even strengthen even further because we seem to have very much aligned objectives. Uh, China, on the other hand, um, is an economic superpower and having the, the canal were, uh, as one of our main sources of uh, of economic funding, it makes all the sense uh, to continue to have uh, a relation with China in terms of the trade, the Panama Canal, and we're, I think we're going to continue to do that. We've chosen not to be in the middle of any uh, of the big giant discussions in terms of trade or politics or whatever. We don't think that that's our role. And um, especially having the Panama Canal, we hope to remain as neutral as possible in any sort of the, the standoff that may happen uh, for different matters. Let me ask you, let's switch to immigration um, since our time is, is uh, running short. 
a lot of immigrants to the United States, particularly children, are uh, crossing through that Darien jungle, which is, as you know, so dangerous. Um, UNICEF says 15 times more children are crossing that dangerous jungle towards the United States in the last four years. What um, t Talk about that, what you're doing, what you're seeing. Yes, um, well, we've had a regular immigration for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, the pandemic has made it worse. And also, I think that there's a degree of responsibility that the countries where those migrants are arriving should assume, right? Because most of those migrants, they don't arrive in Panama. And frankly, they don't arrive in Colombia. They arrive further south and then they start making their way up. And I, I think that, so that's first issue that we need to deal with. Uh, they are they go by foot It's terrible it's very difficult panama is the only country in the region that we provide food shelter we do biometric uh to understand who they are and if in case they are dangerous individuals we report them um and we have we were trying to to do sort of a humanitarian approach in terms of managing but with covid it makes it really really hard and that's why we we just uh, formalize our request to Colombia to try to make it uh, more manageable and assume more responsibility. We have an agreement with Costa Rica where we don't sort of let all of them go by our border. We have a quota and we don't do any more than that. We're hoping that Colombia can agree to the same because the border, the, the, the jungle that we have with Colombia is one of the most dangerous in the world. And letting them just go by, uh, sometimes they get snake bites, they get lost. Uh, it, seven days and through a really, really dense ju jungle is really difficult to manage. And if we can have some control, we can go and actually at least pick them up. But we, we have no clue who's arriving or when they're arriving. It's really hard to manage. And so how would you, I mean, you're in a p perfect position to comment on this, um, being the foreign minister of Panama. What would you do to stem the tide of children in particular, but migrants going to the U.S. border under all these, these incredibly dangerous um, uh, situations? Well, as I said, I think the first issue is who allowed them in the first place. I can say for Panama, we have a visa requirement for Haiti, for Nigeria, for Senegal, for all the countries, and that allows us to be responsible with whom we let in. Um, and I think that the same responsibility should be managed by all the countries because you can't just allow uh, them to arrive and then look the other way and not deal with, it's really a humanitarian crisis that we may have in the coming future if we don't deal with it in a responsible manner. And do you think the United States is dealing with it in a responsible manner? I think that the United States is very focused in the Northern Triangle migration. And we're hoping, and I, and I say this for Panama, to, to draw a little bit of the attention to what's happening in this kind of migration, which is just a separate one. And uh, one that may see may, or may show itself in a few months once it makes all the way up to, to Mexico and, and, and try to cross the border because they all want to go to the U.S. We try to uh, get them interested in staying, resocialization. They are not interested in staying. They, they, they have sort of like this one-minded approach where they want to head. So I want to remind our audience that you're welcome to, um, to ask questions, submit them on the website. Um, is that correct, Bev? Submit them on the website. And I wanted to turn it over to Dan, who had some thoughts on this as well. Go ahead. So, Minister, I I really love your country. I like going. I like going on vacation there. I'm anxious when I get my second shot. I'm going to get on Copa and I'm going to fly down there. I really, it's a wonderful place. And I know there's a reason why a lot of Americans visit and not only visit but retire to Panama. Um, and your country that's you know a con countries that exceed eight thousand dollars per capita and Panama exceeds X thousand dollars eight thousand dollars per capita. Um, are countries that don't have migration. So you don't have a lot of folks from Panama migrating because Panama is a demo consolidated democracy. It's safe, it's attractive for investment, and it's it's a prosper, rel relatively prosperous society. 
And you've also, but but talk a little bit about, um, you have many folks coming from Venezuela and other places, you've talked a little bit about this. Talk about how many Ven folks in Venezuela are living now in Panama and talk about how, you know, how how is Panama managing that? Yeah, so um, we estimate, because we don't have for obvious reasons, sort of uh, formal data, that 10% of our population are Venezuelans. That's the highest uh, for at least within the region. Um, and I just visited one of the migrant camps on Monday. Um, and I think the second largest nationality was, in fact, or were Venezuelans. Um, so that's something that continues to happen for the reasons we all know what's happening in Venezuela. And I think I, I try to always sort of think of whatever people have the idea of what's happening in Syria, it's happening in Venezuela. It's just that it's not as evident to all of us of how, how dire the conditions are there. Um, and, and you're correct in saying there are no, we don't have uh, migrants, meaning Panamanians, looking to go to neighboring countries. They'll stay here. We don't have anybody by foot or, you know, sort of uh, a, a problem in the border. So what we're dealing only or exclusively is sort of with this inbound migration, uh, mostly from the south. But it is not only Venezuelans or Haitians, but we have sort of also from uh, extra continental, uh, such as Africa, that are also coming. And it's really hard and if you think about uh, more uh, sort of in the outer cities uh, where they arrive. Think of a small town of 300 individuals and overnight they get a thousand literally a thousand uh, migrants arriving. They're not prepared. They, they, we don't have any sort of infrastructure to deal with that kind of migration in a responsible manner. Madam Minister, what are your top priorities now that you've been in office for a couple of months, but what, what's your great vision and passion moving forward that you really want to accomplish during your time in office? Yeah, so um, the, the Panama name has been, uh, I think, severely and negatively impacted uh, by recent scandals that frankly had very little to do with Panama, uh, such as the Panama Papers. And I think it's unfortunate. Could you describe that, just step in a little bit, just describe that to our audience briefly, as briefly as you can. Sure. Uh, so uh, that scandal, um, there were no Panamanian banks involved. The corporations were not Panamanian. The customers were not Panamanian. It just happened to be that the law firm had offices here, but they were selling and dealing with transactions, foreign transactions, dealing mostly with other jurisdictions. Um, so rather than saying this was really somebody else's responsibility, what I can say is this wasn't really Panama. And unfortunately, we became sort of like the scapegoat for something that is happening more broadly, but Panama is not at the center. When you look at uh, tax structuring, Panama is not the place where they go. We're not a tax haven for a number of reasons. Um, our, our corporations are not at the top of their jurisdictions of choice, not even in the top 10. Uh, but anyway, having said that, we are where we are. And what we're looking to do is to sort of turn the page and just talk about what Panama really is, um, how safe, how um, it, it, the how proven our system is and it is because you can look at even last year when we went out to the market um, on bond issues the most positive response from markets was in fact towards Panama um, so you can see that that the sector believes in Panama uh, we're just hoping to have that image uh, permeate to through everybody and go beyond sort of corporations not corporations uh, issues that we discussed today, uh, for instance, climate change. Panama is one of the three countries in the world that is carbon negative, in the world. So um, we have, I think, a lot to talk about positive that I think we can spark interest and we're looking for that kind of investment as well, as well sort of more sustainable. Um, if we as a country that depends on services and trade, if we can become carbon negative, uh, we can sort of drive more of that and become a leader. We have the biggest chip register in the world, so we can become a leader in that kind of uh, uh, purpose. And on the inclusion and gender that we just discussed here, 
I am 43. I'm not an entrenched party loyalist. I actually arrived a day before inauguration. So I, I think the bet that the country made on me is an example of how much we believe in women. We believe in sort of professional and we want to drive that change. And we're hoping to also all those initiatives that we were talking about sort of create a more multilateral approach where there's more accountability. Again, other things that we can let others know about Panama beyond what's been in the past. Just following up on the sustainability, um, negative carbon emissions or a negative um, footprint. What's your advice to other countries? What was the vision that that's getting you there? Well, one third of our country are protected areas, and that's made a huge impact because you can, whatever you want to do, if one third of your of your areas are protected, so our biggest rainforest, regardless of what kind of development you wanted to do, they were protected. Uh, that's one. Second, we're surrounded by oceans, and I don't think that people put enough importance in what the oceans contribute to climate change. And they are, in fact, you know, 85% uh, of the ex oxygen we breathe comes from the oceans and illegal fishery, fishing, I'm sorry, um, not dealing properly with, uh, with how to maintain your coral reefs and all that. So I think we're now doing a big push. We have the Our Ocean Conference happening in Panama, which is the biggest for oceans next year. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to drive more momentum towards not only sort of on, on land, but also in the oceans. That's great. Um, we have a question from the audience. Since breaking relations abruptly with Taipei, Panama is now working to establish trade. Oh, is Panama now working to establish trade or commercial represent representing offices to facilitate continued trade and import important investments such as Evergreen Marine's port operations? So the question is, if we are considering, are you working to establish since breaking relations abruptly? with Taipei, uh -huh. is Panama now working to establish trade or commercial representative offices to facilitate continued trade and important investments such as Evergreen Marine's port operations? Yeah, so, so we're evaluating all of our options at the moment in terms of foreign relations and what can drive investment and momentum in terms of uh, this. We have limited resources in every single country, I think. So uh, whatever we can look for that. We don't have a specific plans that I can sort of uh, outline right now with regards to Taiwan, but I think we're open to everything that makes sense in terms of our foreign policy. Great. I know Bev wanted to ask another question. You're on mute, Bev. Sorry about that. I, I wanted to uh, uh, ask a, a, another uh, a, another question that's a little bit gender focused. And um, I wanted to follow up on something you said earlier about making sure that women have opportunities. Um, what is Panama doing in terms of its relations with uh, its neighbors and also its neighbors in the Caribbean in terms of promoting gender equality and gender equity and uh, helping them follow in the example that you are, are taking there to make sure that women are educated for the jobs of the future? Yeah, so I, I think that, um, first of all, it's a political uh, connection that it's very much needed. It's needed in Central America, it's needed in the Caribbean. Uh, we could be a very powerful block if we were more articulate, if we were more connected, and we're not there yet, but we can be. Um, so I think that the first approach is trying to to work on those relations. Um, I'm hoping that um, uh, as, as women, the few that we are, we have sort of the sisterhood already created that I think is important and interesting to 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 foster sort of uh, more momentum on the political front. Um, and it also involves so we've been talking to uh, neighboring countries about uh, more seminars and conferences to get more women interested in running for office. 
the more that you do that and that exchange ideas in what made what was successful in one country or not or what we just passed for instance a law sort of sanctioning uh violence for women and in, in public office particularly online um, and we were sharing some of those practices with some of the countries and as something that's made difference or has been positive in, in driving that, that change. And if I could follow up on the uh, challenges for women running for office, I know we see that in this country, uh, women often may not put themselves forward for office. Um, it, do you have that similar challenge in Panama and in all of Latin America? Yes, I, I think um, the numbers speak for themselves. It's not only that they're not elected, but they don't put themselves, they don't run um, enough. And um, I think that the first thing that we need to do is back each other up, uh, regardless of political party, just the fact that you're a woman and that you venture yourself and you said, I'm going to do this, uh, should be enough to warrant sort of uh, support from other women. Um, sometimes that's not always what happens and we need to call it out. We look at the comments and the most sort of vicious comments sometimes come from women themselves. And this is something that happens and we need to talk about it and try to change that, uh, that narrative into something more positive. Nina, so back to you. To, to end um, on, on this note, um, we started Smart Women, Smart Power, how many years ago, Bev? Um, five, six years Almost ago. Almost seven. Seven, wow. Um, and it, the idea is to give, to amplify the voices of women in national security and foreign affairs. And you know, so a lot of um, a lot of our events draw women who are looking to pursue a career path like yours. I wanted to just end by asking you to give those women watching today a bit of advice. What gives you confidence? What keeps you going? What should they know moving forward if they want to reach the great heights that you're clearly reaching? Um, I think my first note is um, you need to forgive yourself or not be perfect at all fronts because it's really hard. And I think that the moment that you move from that into more sort of accepting and it's OK if I'm not at a birthday party or I'm not there for a family or, you know, you'll still be great at what you're doing and, and sort of that first move, it's very positive. And the second is it is incredibly rewarding much more that I think that what we can think of as women, um, motivating other women, particularly uh, little girls that are looking and when they see you, they think, wow, I can do that, or uh, it is possible. That to me, it's much more rewarding than what you can think of. So you just need to, to believe that it can happen. You will find people that will support you, I am sure. And um, it, you know, events like this, it just shows that there is momentum there and we can all try to, create positive change. Thank you, Madam Minister. That's great. Over to you, Bev. <laughs> thank you, Nina. And thank you, Madam Minister. And thank you, Dan Rundy. This has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. We are so honored that you joined us today for Smart Women, Smart Power. And we're thankful to all of you watching for joining us. Our next event is coming up on June 1st with Jean Case, CEO of the Case Impact Network. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.